Okay, we are going to get started. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Maryam Alavi, Dean of Scheller College of Business. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm delighted you're here. And uh, tonight we are in for a real treat, hearing about leadership from a true leader. Uh, our guest tonight is uh, Michael T. Duke. Uh, I am proud to say that Mike is Distinguished Executive Fellow here at Scheller College of Business at Georgia Tech. Uh, and of course, he is past, and I should say, retired president and CEO of a small store you might have heard about, <laughs> Walmart Incorporated. So let me give you a little bit of a background. Uh, his bio is just truly stellar, and we could spend a whole hour just talking about his achievements. But I'll be brief, because I know you want to hear about uh, his current thinking on leadership. So uh, Mike, uh, during his tenure as CEO, Mike helped Walmart navigate a period of economic, social, and technological change while delivering strong financial results. He put in place the building blocks for the company's future by making critical investments in technology and talent, including a strong management team. He also broadened Walmart's commitment to lead on some of the most pressing social and environmental issues of our time. He has long been a champion of diversity and was specially engaged in the advancement of women both inside and outside of the company. He joined Walmart in 1995, and over the time uh, with the company, uh, he led the logistics, distribution, and administration divisions, as well as Walmart USA. And in 2005, he was appointed to vice chairman with responsibility for Walmart International. Prior to joining Walmart, he had 23 years of experience in retailing with federated department stores and May department stores. He served on the board of directors of Walmart Stores Incorporated from 2008 to 2016. And uh, he also served on the board of directors of the Consumer Goods Forum, the Executive Committee of Business Roundtable, the Board of Advisors of University of Arkansas, and the Advisory Board of Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He currently serves uh, on the Georgia Tech Foundation Board of Trustees and is on the Board of Directors of Chick-fil-A and the Board of Directors of Bible Study Fellowship International. He also serves as an operations executive with the Carlyle Group. Mike holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Industrial Engineering and an honorary doctoral degree from Georgia Tech. He and his wife, Susan, have two daughters and a son. Let's give a Georgia Tech welcome to Mike Duke. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, that's really exaggerated. I didn't know all of that myself. This is so, one of the most yeah. humble person I've ever seen. So, uh -huh. um, you know, speaking of leadership and servant leadership. So, Mike, let me start by asking you just to give us a sense of the scope of operations that you led. Give us some statistics about Walmart in terms of size and operations. Hmm. Let me first check. Have y'all heard of Walmart before? <laughs> Anybody ever been to a Walmart store? I hope you've had. Uh, maybe not only uh, here in Atlanta and here in the United States, but even in other places around the world. But So uh, Walmart, obviously, is a big company. And if you do look at the Fortune you know, ranking, Walmart has been number one in the Fortune ranking for about the last eight, nine, ten years, I guess now. Uh, Sales are about a little over 500 billion. It's amazing because uh, you mentioned I joined the company in 1995. When I joined Walmart in 1995, I thought it was a gigantic company, and it was. It was 80 billion, but it's grown. While I've been there, I've got to see the growth of an additional 
$420 million in sales and really got to see Walmart become an international company. In 1995, it was almost all U.S. business. Uh, now, of course, Walmart operates in 27 countries, has 11,000 stores, and there are about 2.3 million associates that work for the company. Uh, I think about 1.5 million here in the United States and about 800,000 or so outside the United States. So you can see the, the U.S. business is still, still the largest, of course, uh, but the international business with 800,000 associates is a big, big operation too, operating in many locations around the world. Uh, a lot of that through acquisition and a lot of it through ground up construction. So Walmart, uh, I guess, Fortune One, I'm, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day operation, but I love the fact that they continue growing the business. This last uh, fourth quarter report that they gave just a couple of weeks ago, they had a uh, growth in physical retail sale, sales at the store level, but they also had a 43% growth in online sales. Uh, so I, I love the way that the company today is growing both physical uh, store visits and, and online business. So it's a uh, company that's maybe a good size operation, but it's still growing. And that's what I, I like to see the growth. And, and at Walmart, we never would talk about the, uh, that question we wouldn't even think appropriate because we just said, let's don't focus on the scale uh, because if anything, it might cause arrogance. Uh, it might cause people to think too much about the scale and it's not that important. What's really important is every individual store and every individual customer. There are 250 million customers uh, that shop in Walmart every week either online or in the store, we said it's not the 250 million customers that's important, it's every single customer. And think of it one store at a time and one customer at a time, and then we will we'll be a lot better off. So the question you've asked, we avoid talking about inside Walmart, okay. but uh, since you asked, I thought I'd get- Yeah, it's okay to data. talk about it outside of Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I mean, it's almost like running a small country. You know, when you think about it, you know, the number of associates and the size of the uh, revenues and all of that. So let me start to focus on your own personal journey of leadership. What does leadership mean to you? And what do you think is the essence of good leadership? That's a great starting question. And uh, what we're supposed to be maybe finish by six and I could go from now till six on that one question, but I'll try to be brief on it because I, I really uh, have been a student of leadership since I, I think I, I got out of Georgia Tech and I went to work here in Atlanta, Georgia for um, my first boss and my first mentor. And he is here today on the Georgia Tech Board of Trustees as a trustee emeritus his name is John Whitenauer. And I thought immediately when I got out of Georgia Tech in 1971 and I got into retailing and I started reporting to John Whitenauer, I started then really looking at what is leadership all about? So uh, I'll try to summarize because I really think leadership is all about people. John Whitenauer told me in the opening interview when I came out of tech and I was considering, I had job offers from Procter & Gamble and other great companies. And he told me in that very first interview in retailing, he said, we can't afford to pay you what they're offering you uh, for a job working as an industrial engineer. But he said, let me promise you one thing. He said, if you get into retailing and you realize that this business is all about people, then I promise you in the long run, you'll come out ahead. He came to my retirement a few years ago and told the story himself. He said, I told you it would work out for you. And, <laughs> and I said today, even this morning, I saw him and I said, I'm going to talk about you tonight. But it's all about people. That's what John White and I told me in my first interview. So start with that premise that leadership is really about people. And I think when it comes to then leading, uh, I always believe there are four most important characteristics. The second part of your question uh, about the four most critical characteristics of great leaders. 
Number one is integrity and trust. If a leader is not trusted, if a leader doesn't have integrity, then nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how good a public speaker you are. It doesn't matter how innovative you are. Nothing else matters. Uh, if integrity and trust are not there, then you, you cannot succeed as a leader. A leader has to be trusted. That's most important. Now, the thing about leadership is you can't have a bad day. You know, you can't average leadership uh, because like when you measure sales, you know, we could say Walmart, well, we had a really good day on Saturday and a bad day on Sunday uh, and, a, and a good day on Monday and it averaged out pretty good. Leadership doesn't work that way. Your lowest point, it becomes the way you're measured as a leader in the area of integrity. Uh, so if you have a lapse of integrity, that's how your people, your team, will end up valuing, valuing you, you as a leader in the area of integrity. So you just can never, ever shortchange the importance of integrity, the most single important characteristic of leadership. Number two is the putting all of the priority on other people. Take it off of yourself and leadership is about others, not you. And realizing how important the other people are and it's not about you, it's about them. Uh, practicing the golden rule, treating people the way you like to be treated. That's really what this aspect of leadership is about. It's what uh, this area of people leadership is all about. Realizing that in this area of people, your most important decisions you make are not gonna be capital allocation or anything else. I hate to say this to the finance professors and others, it's gonna be the decisions you make about people. Who do you hire, who do you promote, and who do you release? Uh, to be candid, sometimes you have to make those tough decisions. And people, putting people first is the second most important characteristic of leadership. Number three, is being able to excel in execution while at the same time leading innovation and strategic planning. How do you do both? And maybe we can talk about that some more because not all of us are skilled at both. So what that really now comes into play is how do you build a team that can do both, that you can execute and innovate at the same time. Great leaders have an ability to do both of execution and innovation and I can tell you some examples of that. And then number four is really important also, a leader creates an environment. So what is the environment that you create? And I think particularly if you're leading a company like Walmart with 2.3 million people working in, in the company, we say associates, we don't call employees at Walmart. We say that there are 2.3 million associates because we're all associates in the company. And this environment that a leader creates, uh, what is the, the purpose of the company? What's the mission of the organization? You may even have a small team, and, but what's your mission? What's your purpose? What are your, cult your culture, your values? And the leader establishes the mission, purpose, culture, and the values of an organization. So in, uh, in about five minutes, I'll be giving you what would be typically an hour uh, message about leadership to try to answer that first question. So. Well, that we uh, appreciate that because there are lots of other great questions that we want to ask of you and learn from you. Uh, what has been your most um, rewarding experience as a leader? Uh, it's always seeing other people advance. And uh, I will tell you, when I... Uh, Back a few years ago, when I was talking to the Walmart Board of Directors about uh, transition and my retirement, I started talking, and it's really interesting. My first board meeting in 2008, when I went into a board meeting as the CEO of the company, one of the board of, members of the Board of Directors said, Mike, tell us your thoughts about your succession strategy as a CEO of the company. And I kind of laughed and I said, this is my first meeting. Uh, of the board of directors and you're already asking me about who's going to take my place. I, and I kind of laughed and said, are you trying to send a signal to me up front? And this particular director said, we sure are, that the single most important thing you do will be developing people. And uh, so be thinking about, and in every board meeting at Walmart as a CEO, I talked about 
my succession plan. Who would be the next CEO? Who was who was I investing in developing? Um, so I had the great thrill. A person that I had worked with for a number of years, a really really talented leader named Doug McMillan was who I recommended and who then became the CEO to follow me as when I retired from that job at Walmart. So anytime uh, I could see other people getting promoted, then that's the greatest thrill I ever had. I think when um, one promotion early days, and I think you learn things early on in, in your business career that really stick with you. And I remember I was working with, before I joined Walmart, it was with a department store uh, and I was in Washington, DC and I got a promotion to move to St. Louis, which is where the corporate office was. And when I was promoted, uh, they had a going away party, but seven people got promoted because of my promotion. It just kind of was a ripple effect and they all were happy to see me go, uh, you know, and I, I worked with them closely and I loved them all, but they said the greatest thing that ever happened to them is me getting promoted because it freed up a ripple effect took place. You know, someone could get promoted to take my job, then someone else got promoted to take that job and so forth. And there was a lineup of seven people that were promoted. So those were always my greatest thrill was uh, seeing other people be able to advance their careers and take on more responsibility and and if I felt like I had any small part of it, then then I got personal gratification from it. But I really enjoyed seeing them celebrate and their families celebrate their advancement. Great. So now I want uh, to ask you about uh, the role of mistakes that, uh, and just to make us feel better, that you're not perfect. Uh, if you care to share some some mistakes or a mistake that you made in your journey of leadership, that was really important and what you mm. learned from that. Ooh, again, we could go on all night because uh, I guarantee you I've made more mistakes than most anyone in business. And at Walmart, we say that Walmart has made more mistakes than any other company. So if, if Fortune were to rank the companies that made the most mistakes, Walmart would rank number one in that category also. Well, when you're that big, yeah, I can <laughs> see that, yes. And I can think of a number, I'll give a couple of examples, because I think sometimes the mistakes early in working career can, be, can become more impactful in the long term. And I was here in Atlanta, Georgia, working for Richway Stores, which was the company that I mentioned earlier that John Whitenauer was leading the opening of this new retail store being built in Atlanta. And I was in like a training assignment. I had my engineering degree, but I was working in a store and I had a training assignment working as an assistant store manager. And it was a great assignment and I worked lots of hours. But I remember one mistake I made is I just completely forgot about an area of my responsibility. And the vice president of our store operations came to visit and somehow he knew the weak spot. It was the outside garden area of the store. He probably drove around the store and he saw that it was a disaster. It was just a horrible disaster. It was unsafe for customers to even shop in. The plants were dead. You know, it was a, and he walked in the front of the store and I was kind of proud of the way the inside of the store looked. And he said to me, said, Mike, let's go check out your outside garden center. And it just hit me that I had completely forgotten about an area of the store. I hadn't even been out there probably for three or four or five days, you know. And it taught me a lesson about that you can't let any, if you're responsible for an area of responsibility, you know, you can't let any part of it slip. You've always got to be able to manage the whole enterprise that you're assigned to and any area can can be responsible. And I thought I, I thought that was going to be the end of my career in retailing. As a matter of fact, when we were standing out in the garden center, he looked at me and he said, Mike, he said, I know you went to Georgia Tech, you studied industrial engineering. He said, do you really think this retailing is for you? Uh, and looking around the, the dead plants, I was thinking to myself, maybe it's not, maybe I belong somewhere else, you know, but he then gave me encouragement. And he said, you're learning and this will be a valuable lesson. And 
So that was one. I had a mistake, serious mistake, a few years later. I was in a supply chain engineering role and we installed new systems and they just didn't work. We put in uh, automated sortation. This was in Washington, D.C. in a distribution center and it just wasn't working. The technology wasn't working. Maybe I had gone a little too advanced and that's something you have to be at times thoughtful about what's the right pace of technology installation. And uh, what I really found out though, my mistake wasn't technology and it wasn't the installation. It wasn't, the, it was that I had not empowered and properly trained the people to use the systems and the technology. And I had an associate named Gene. Gene was a wonderful associate who had grown up in the, in the company, started as an hourly associate and had gotten into management. And she said, Mike, she said, I think if you just teach us, train us and empower us, then you can work fewer hours yourself. And we, I think we she said, I think we can make this work. And I started realizing then that training and investing in people is so much more important. I guess later in my career, I made the bigger job I had, the bigger the mistakes I made. Um, so I remember in 2005, I'd just been promoted. Uh, Marian mentioned I was named vice chairman and I was responsible, I was named president of Walmart International. And so I was responsible for all the Walmart business outside the United States. And I made a trip to India and I, in that job and in the uh, next jobs I had, I would meet the presidents of countries. And I met uh, Prime Minister Singh in India in his office. And Walmart was big enough in 2005 that he really, really wanted Walmart to come to India. And uh, so uh, we had a great conversation. And he said, I promise you, uh, the Prime Minister of India said, I promise you when we get to the next election in March of next year, that we will change the laws in India and Walmart will be welcome and we will open up the laws to allow foreign companies to own direct to consumer retailing in India. Uh, and I thought he was right. And I learned a valuable lesson about governments and democracies uh, that a lot of times great leaders in government intend to, to do the right thing and they even maybe say it, but they may not have the political power. And Prime Minister Singh was a great leader in India, but he didn't have the political power. So we invested a lot of money uh, in preparation uh, that uh, they, India still has severe restrictions, even to this day, 14 years later, it's hard uh, uh, really a, a company cannot own direct to consumer business in India. So that was one, again, a valuable learning mistake about uh, working with government. So I, again, could have many, many more. We, we celebrate mistakes at Walmart because it's not a, making the mistake is, is, you know, you try not to, but yet it's gonna happen. The really important thing is what do you learn from it? And if you really learn from it and you can become better because of the mistake. The founder of our company, Sam Walton, uh, one of the greatest business leaders of all time, probably made one of the biggest mistakes in the history of Walmart. He, and, uh, he went to France and he saw these gigantic uh, stores in France called hypermarkets. They were huge stores. And he thought that would be a brilliant idea to bring back to the United States. And he came back with the idea and he kind of copied and he built four of them, two of them in Kansas and two in, in Dallas, Texas. And they were huge stores and they had every bit of food, gigantic food store and a gigantic general merchandise store all in one huge roof. And they turned out to be a disaster. Uh, they, too much capital investment, too much labor cost. Uh, the shrinkage was a problem and the, the, the business just could never justify the amount of capital and expenses of operating the hypermarkets in the United States. And even Sam Walton said, we've made a terrible mistake. And he said, but you know, he said, there's still something here. He said, I still think customers will buy food in a Walmart store. 
And he said, I still think there's something. So he, he created a new store and he opened a much smaller, much more efficient version in a little town called Washington, Missouri. And he called it a Walmart super center. And that was a, the learning of making the mistake with the hypermart and then correcting it with creating a new format called a super center that was smaller and more efficient. And today worldwide of the 500 billion in Walmart sales, I think almost 80% of it uh, is done in what is a super center type of store and no hypermarts. We closed the hypermarts uh, and then have opened thousands of super centers since Washington, Missouri first opened. So that was a case of learning from the mistake. Sometimes it's referred to as learning by doing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the best advice, leadership advice that you received? You mentioned uh, your first uh, employer saying it's all about people, but mm -hmm. anything else that comes to mind? You know, I think um, I mentioned John Whitener, my first boss, and he gave me so much advice uh, as a mentor. But I would probably even dial back sooner, earlier than that. Uh, my high school physics teacher, uh, my high school physics teacher gave me three bits of advice, some of it about leadership and some of it about practical decisions. He recommended that I go to Georgia Tech. He, he understood that I was coming from a poor family and that I needed to go to a school in the state of Georgia and, uh, and to get state uh, expenses and so forth. So he said, uh, go to Georgia Tech. And he said, and, and I said, why? And he said, first, he said, well, and this is the leadership part. He said, you always really need to understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. And he said, let me help you. He said, I think you're really, really good in quantitative and math and science. And he said, I really think engineering would be a really good area for you because you're really good in math and science. And he said, on the other hand, he said, I bet you don't enjoy reading and writing uh, is my suspicion. And I said, Mr. McDaniel, you're exactly right. I said, I don't like reading and writing at all. And, and I said, I love physics and I love math and science. He said, that's an important thing to always recognize in, uh, in your future is really have a true evaluation of what your strengths are, but also know what your weaknesses are and then leverage your strengths. Use your strengths first. He said, some people want to work on their weaknesses first. My advice, he said, is work on your strengths and then still recognize your weaknesses. So he said, go to Georgia Tech. I only applied to one school. I could not get into Georgia Tech. I guarantee you today, there's no chance I'd be here sitting in class with you because the standards back at that time weren't as high as they are today. But I, fortunately, I got into Georgia Tech because I didn't have a backup plan. His second bit of advice was to major in industrial engineering. Now today, I'd say to a business school, you know, business, we didn't, the business school was not nearly back then what it is today. Even my high school physics teacher might have had a different thought then, but, but I only had one major, which was industrial engineering. His third bit of advice was once you get out of Georgia Tech with your degree in industrial engineering, go to work in a service industry, not manufacturing. He said there's so much more career opportunity in service industries than there will be in manufacturing. He said, let all the other engineers go into, into manufacturing and you go into service and you'll, you'll do really well. And I followed his path there too and only ever worked in one business, which was the retail service business. A lot of great insight for coming from a physics uh, teacher and right. science on that focus. Many, many years ago too. Yeah, many years ago, being so in tune mm -hmm. with business and business dynamics. Right. So you started to talk about this a little bit in the, your opening answer to my opening question. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea that leaders need to be good at both strategy and innovation mm -hmm. as well as execution. Uh, it's really the idea that leaders need to be good at managing paradoxes. Mm -hmm. They need to be ambidextrous. Uh, for example, leaders to be, need to be optimistic, but also realistic. Uh, they need to be confident, but also um, uh, humble mm -hmm. and modest. Uh, how do you balance that? How do you do this on the one hand, on the other hand type of work? That can be a real challenge. And it is true that leaders need to have that 
that kind of agility because think of what leading is. It's really about a team and it could be a, a leadership team of 10, 12 people, or it could be a whole organization like, like a company like Walmart. And a leader has to recognize what's the kind of the direction of the team. And as a leader, what's the direction we need the team to go. I can think of uh, one story about Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. And they, the statement was made that when sales were really, really good and the company was doing the very, very best, then he as a leader was really tougher. He would then be more demanding and expect more because so often uh, people would start to get, uh, you know, if sales were really good, then the people would want to start to relax a little bit and to say, look what we've accomplished. And egos could start growing and start to bring in some arrogance because things are going really, really well. And then the leader, Sam, uh, would say, I, as a leader, he would need to be a little more agile and say, we've got to raise the bar. We can't be satisfied you know, with the kind of sales growth we've got. And he would set even higher expectations when things were, were going really, really, really well and would be tougher on the standards. When business was tougher, he would then be in some ways more empathetic and he would be caring more for people because if he thought the people were really doing the best they could, and that's what he tried to bring out is, are you doing the very best you can? And recognize that sometimes, you know, 2008, when I was named CEO, uh, y'all all know, when you look at the business cycle, what was going on in the economy and the world in 2008. And uh, sometimes you have to adjust based on the external factors around. This thing on agility, sometimes uh, back to my high school physics teacher, where he said, know what your strengths are and know what your weaknesses are. I was thinking about a great company uh, that I had a lot of interaction and Walmart still does with Apple and uh, the founder of Apple, you know, Steve Jobs was a brilliant guy, brilliant innovation and ideas uh, way ahead of the time. I mean, who thought of digitizing music and doing the kind of things that he thought of? I mean, who would have dreamed of the iPhone? So in the area of innovation, uh, Steve was amazing, uh, but not necessarily in the area of execution. So what does he do? He knows to recruit someone like Tim Cook. Tim Cook, I knew when, uh, when he was there as the chief operating officer, and Tim Cook was brilliant at execution. He had responsibility for the supply chain and how to get Apple product from all manufactured and get it to Walmart stores. Uh, and the two of them made a great team. Now Tim recognizes uh, that he's still great in execution, but he's also, he's learned more about innovation, but he also has an, a great team of innovation around him too. So sometimes the agility can be the leader's agility, but it also can be building a team of leaders. I like, uh, you know, I, I played uh, high school baseball and I like it in high school baseball, there are nine positions on the field and every single position is a different skill set and different needs. And I think sometimes thinking of a leadership team is a good way to think about it is that what are the different skills that le different leaders can bring to make the team even better? And I think that's where agility can come into play also uh, is the skills of a whole team combined. Great, thank you. I want to shift gears on you. Uh, pretty much the questions and our conversation has been about uh, personal leadership, you know, your experiences uh, and uh, your individual journey. I want to focus on business and organizational leadership now. Uh, so what are some of the forces that are going to impact business strategy over the next five to 10 years? So where do you see things going? I wish I really knew the answer to that. You know, it would be because it would have so much opportunity of investment, but I can tell you the best guess I have. The, right. This, uh, I think if I am 30% correct, 
then, uh, or a different way of saying it, if I'm 70% wrong, uh, that'll still be a reasonable estimate because the one thing that's occurring right now is things are moving so much faster than they did in all of the years that I was working and in business. Uh, if we moved at one speed, we're at X, we're at five X today, where business is moving so much faster. So five years from now, will be equivalent of asking 25 years ago, what's it gonna be like? Mm -hmm. And no one 25 years ago would have ever envisioned the kind of technology impact and how the internet would impact business. And no one could have predicted the speed that business is moving today. So for even me to predict five years out is, is a really remote guesstimate. I do think that some of the principles are still gonna be critically important. These critical, important characteristics of leadership will still be critically important. So don't think that the world's changing and integrity is not important. Integrity is gonna be even more important. Transparency, you know, I like, uh, I got to know Mark Zuckerberg and Cheryl and the Facebook team. And uh, when they would come to visit Walmart, they'd say, the really great intention they had maybe they got uh, sometimes a little ahead of their skis but they said uh the idea of transparency has got to be positive now i do think in general uh, transparency can bring integrity uh in the right uh values and right circumstances so i do think a lot of the things that are that i've said to that are critical today about leadership will still be and maybe even be more important five years from now. And standards of integrity, I believe, will be one of those where it'll be even more obvious uh, who to trust and what companies to trust. And the companies that are trusted will be even more successful. And the companies and the people that are not trusted will fail quicker than they've done in the past. Uh, so I think this speed of failure uh, to lack of integrity will occur even more in the future. I do think people are still gonna be critically important, but the skills that people have are gonna to need to be different. You know, business skills that will need to be different. Skills about using quantitative uh, skills will be critically important. The role of artificial intelligence, the role of machine learning, how to integrate people and power of digital will be even more important. So I, I think that even the investments in quantitative skills and artificial intelligence and in ways to use data uh, better in the future will be really, really important in the future. And so I think there'll be new companies, new, new tools, new technology that will be disrupted. I, I like the fact that Jeff Bezos even said the other day, uh, you may have read that he said Amazon is likely to be disrupted and someday go out of business. You know, he didn't he didn't want to imply that it's this year or next year, but I think he's kind of putting kind of a, a statement out there to say that disruption five years from now uh, is going to be faster and stronger than even uh, that it's been in the last five years going to be an exciting world with all the changes and the speed of it. Uh, so you talked about building a team that has various skills and backgrounds and uh, capabilities. Uh, what did you look for in your team as you were assembling the teams? What were some of the key characteristics? You know, we can say it was integrity. It was mm -hmm. some of the issues that you brought up. But what were some of the biggest turnoffs for mm -hmm. you in, in people? The biggest single turnoff um, that sometimes you can't understand integrity right off the bat. Like in an interview, it's hard to say, is this person a person of integrity? Some cases you can tell quickly, but in some cases you can't. But you can very often see arrogance uh, or you can see humility. And so a big, uh, a big turnoff for me would be someone that in an interview or initial introduction wanted to really talk about themselves. And if they really use the word I, I've accomplished this, I've done this. Uh, if, I, if I perceived 
that they are more about their own personal uh, ego, then that's an immediate, that doesn't work at Walmart. You know, it's unfortunate. And I've told people that, uh, that there's somewhere else that would be a better fit for you uh, because at Walmart, you're part of 2.3 million people and uh, you just can't worry about the I accomplish. You've got to about worry about what the team accomplishes. So humility compared to arrogance is critical. If a person wants to talk about compensation more than they do contribution. Uh, so when a person comes in and I meet with them and they, they really are interested in how they can contribute to the organization, then for me, that's exciting. But if they really want to spend their time talking about compensation, uh, then I'm less excited. Uh, it'd be like John White our, his interview with me, he told me, and he's, and frankly, I will, I don't mind sharing it. Uh, my initial job offer, yours will be better. My initial job offer coming out of Georgia tech to go into retailing was $9,000 a year. Now I had a job offer from Procter and Gamble for 12,000 and a couple of others in that range. And I accepted the $9,000 offer because I really, really was excited about working with John White and I working for people. So thinking about what's the, what are the priorities of this individual and will they fit the team? And you have to really evaluate the team that you're on. You know, I'm speaking to you from the perspective of Walmart uh, and Walmart has a unique culture. It's a unique organization. You might be a part of a different organization that has different values and a different, uh, but the characteristics of teammates uh, I'm discussing to end response to the question. Okay. So you talked about speed of change and disruption, uh, which really brings this issue around the importance and significance of innovation. How would a company, particularly a large company uh, like Walmart, how do you instill a culture of innovation so that the company continues to innovate? And Walmart, given its scale, that, I'm sorry, that impresses me a lot, the size of the, uh, the company. And then you talked about the agility and look what Walmart has done that Amazon seems to be trying to replicate, which is the idea of both in-store and online seamless experience, right? So it takes a lot to create that kind of agility in such a large corporation to be able to become digital and do so well um, in terms of where you are. So how do you create this culture of innovation, particularly where they're such a hefty company. So how do they move so fast? Well, and I would say that we've always felt like at Walmart, we needed to move faster. So we, we never felt comfortable that we were moving fast enough. So even when I think about today or when I was still working full time, we were so self-critical about how slow we were moving that, uh, that that's the starting point. The other would be is how do you, uh, celebrate, I mentioned this earlier, but how do you celebrate innovation, even failure in innovation in the appropriate way? And, uh, and in some ways you have to find those ways so that, so that people are not afraid uh, to try things and not afraid to experiment. Uh, I uh, had been called at one early in my career and I ended up taking it as a compliment over time, but I was called Maverick. And, and, I, and the company that I was working with at the time, this was before Walmart, because I was just willing to jump in and try things. And some of them failed. But so I love that personally though, and even being called the word maverick, uh, I kind of like the idea that, that, that not everybody thought that was a positive term, but at least I took it in a positive way over time. And I tried to create that even at Walmart is to say, how do we, have leaders that are really willing to try things. You know, one of my uh, heroes, uh, heroes in life and in business was uh, Coach John Wooden. He was the UCLA men's basketball coach. And when you look, he died a few years ago at 99. So he coached back in the 1970s, but he won seven. Now we get into March Madness, if you follow basketball, 
he won seven consecutive men's national championships. You know, one in like nine altogether, but seven in a row, which is unheard of. And they asked him after he had won four or five, they asked him at the beginning of a year, Coach Wooden, uh, is it your goal to win another national championship this year? You would think his obvious answer would be yes. But he, did, he said, no. He said, that's not my goal. He said, my goal is that every player on the team will perform to their fullest potential on every single play. He said, if every person can perform to their fullest potential on every play, then the outcome, the result, may be winning another. And he did. He won another one and another one and another one. And I think about that related to business today. Think about if every person, regardless of background, where you grew up, what your degree is in, uh, gender, anything, any measure, but if every person on a team could perform to their fullest potential and some that are great at innovation and new ideas could bring the new ideas to the company, then, uh, then that would be the, the, I think, environment that I'd want to have as a leader. And, and frankly, that's where so much about uh, diversity, about opportunity, uh, about teamwork comes into play. And that automatically creates innovation, I think, because many, many have the ability to innovate if you take off the constraints and allow for the innovation. And in fact, there are a number of uh, academic studies that have shown that diversity does in fact lead to innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what I'm going to do, uh, we have about another 14 minutes or so, I, 12 minutes, depending on whose watch or clock you look at. Uh, I'm going to stop here and open it to the audience. Uh, so your questions are welcome. Okay, two here. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting. I have two daughters and a son and, uh, and even, and they're all now in their working, uh, career and families and other things. And, um, uh, and I've always said that, uh, that you want to be sure that you're in a place that you can use your strengths and that you can perform to your fullest potential. And so I've, I've said, so if, as you get into leadership, always try to create that environment, eat, no matter how small or how large your team is, create the environment where every, the John Wooden story, create the environment where every person can perform to their fullest potential. And, you know, I'm really, really proud of our two daughters and our son, uh, one daughter, uh, is a VP in marketing at Walmart, and she's the, has done really, really well. My son is at Nike, and he's a finance leader in Portland at, at Nike. And our other daughter, we're really proud of as a teacher, and she is the world's best math teacher. Uh, <laughs> so somehow she got some of my math love, and uh, and I'm really proud of how they, both as parents and as leaders have done uh, a much better job than I did when I was at that stage of, of my life compared to where they're at at this particular point in time. I would at times, I do remember one, it happened to be my son. He got out of college and he was starting his working career and he had a really, really bad boss as a leader. And so uh, my son Devin came and wanted to tell me about this terrible boss. And he was a terrible boss. I could tell by what Devin was saying that it, he, uh, you know, just was not good to work for. No respect for people, not trusted, he, you know, arrogant, ego. He felt like he had to use four-letter words to communicate, uh, which is just the opposite. If you want to take away leadership, try using curse words. And all that does, every time you use a four-letter word, your, your stack of leadership skills drops. And so Devin, my son, told me these stories and I told him, Devin, think of how fortunate you are. Early in your career, to have this opportunity to work for this person, it, it was a guy, I worked with this guy. I said, you are so fortunate. He said, what do you mean, Dad? 
He said, I, I, it's terrible. I said, you will remember all of these characteristics for the rest of your life. I said, this will be much better than anything I could ever tell you is uh, you're learning firsthand what not to do and how not to treat people. And uh, so I think a lot of learning comes from the actual experience too. Next. Yes, sir. So uh, you talk about the importance of uh, people as the, for the company. How do you stay engaged, not just for the immediate team, but for the extended larger number of people? Well, I have to say, you know, a company with 2.3 million associates, it's really hard. Uh, I would, if I made it sound easy, I apologize uh, because I, uh, I worked a lot of hours and I, and I had to work at staying engaged. <clears throat> I had what I considered kind of a, a diagonal communication style and never, uh, some leaders feel like that all of their time they spend just with their direct reports. And, you know, a typical organization structure, a CEO might have 10 direct reports, you know, 10 VPs or whatever. And some, that's the way they spend most of their time. Uh, I would spend some time there, but I say diagonal because I developed relationships at all levels of the organization. And I had uh, store managers, Walmart has 11,000 stores, which means there are 11,000 store managers. I didn't know all 11,000, but I did have about six or eight or 10 that they trusted me and I trusted them. And I could call them uh, with something confidential. And I'll say, here's something we are considering for the whole company. What's your opinion as a store manager? And then I would even visit stores Sam Walton taught me this, is spend a lot of time out on the front line. And when you're there, talk to the frontline associates. And when I was in logistics, I would go really early in the morning, like 5 a.m. to the, uh, where the truck drivers in the dis distribution centers would take their morning break. Uh, they may have already been making some runs and it'd be about 5 a.m. And I just sit down and have a cup of coffee with truck drivers. So there is no substitute for time. And I think today there are a lot of ways using information through the internet and other things that can help with that. So I would, I would use technology, but also face-to-face -face contact with people in every role in the company and at every level of the company from hourly associates up to the executive VP level. So the this side is, is the question here. Um, can you offer any advice on leading and motivating people in tough economic times? We went through pretty tough periods when we mm -hmm. need to you know, any advice for us? Well, certainly I think uh, listening and, and having an understanding of the environment. Uh, to ignore the external environment would be insensitive and demotivating. Um, so I, I do think you have to start with that. But also I think you can't allow yourself or the company to be a victim. Uh, and so you do have to bring uh, a strategy and a business skill that says, we're not gonna allow ourselves to be victimized even during a difficult time. So what can we do during a difficult time? So as an example, uh, at Walmart during that, the depth of the recession, uh, we could see that uh, people still had to use basics, the basic things that like food and basic supplies that all economic levels were still gonna need to buy, you know, uh, their diapers for their babies and the basic things. And so we decided to even lower prices even more and try to appeal to customers. We actually gained customer traffic during a time when customers were cutting back on. So I think it does require some thoughtful, innovative business strategies to win. So you say, how do we win uh, and create a winning attitude and motivate the team to want to win even during difficult times is really important. Go in the middle, yes. Hi, what is a lesson you learned 
I'm sorry, it's too brief. What was the lesson you learned from Georgia Tech that helped you throughout your career? I think the one thing I think this is true here in this school, it's true in engineering and science, is just plain discipline and hard work. You know, uh, there's no substitute for uh, the effort that you put out. And Georgia Tech is known uh, for you've got to put out the effort. You know, some of you would have a lot more uh, head start than I would uh, with your background and education coming into Georgia Tech. But at whatever level you have, you can do the best you can through hard work and discipline. So I came from a very, very small rural school, a public school in rural area of Georgia that was a small school and did not have the nearly the high standards of academic background that most of you would have had upon entering Georgia Tech. So I had to work a lot harder and I had to work to pay my way through school. So I learned that I had to keep up every day. Uh, that at Georgia Tech, the discipline about daily uh, accomplishment and not procrastinating uh, is a valuable skill. Now, what it taught me later, later in life, when uh, the iPhone and everything, uh, I developed a daily habit and still have this, of uh, every email has to be cleaned off before I go to bed at night. Now, in some cases, it's just hitting delete, you know, uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, because it may, not, it may be a junk mail, but, uh, but in some cases, it required a response. And, and I really, even that particular habit of daily activity, I think goes back to the discipline of accomplishment at Georgia Tech. Okay. Uh, let me go one more question and, uh, and another one back there. So let's start with this. When you were talking about how Steve Jobs is a great innovator and when you hired Tim Cook to help with the execution, mm -hmm. when you find yourself in a team setting, how do you find the balance between excelling in what you do, but also being a little um, understanding of where you might need to grow because sometimes mm -hmm. it's very easy to look at some of your peers on a team that excel in an area that you don't excel in and you might get lost in terms of figuring out where mm -hmm. your true strengths lie. So how do you like reconcile the differences? That's a great question because it's also one of the failings of many leaders <clears throat> is they can't um, accept individuals that are different than them. So if they have a skill in execution, then they really want to just have people around them that are skilled in execution. And they're not comfortable with innovators or people, mavericks that are people outside the, uh, you know, their particular skill set. And that's where I think a leader has to step aside from themselves and look at what's best for the total and truly be objective in the saying, for our organization to accomplish our goals, we've got to have all of these skill sets, and I may not have them all. And so celebrating the difference. And that's where, and I would tell you, I don't think I had this skill early on. It's one that I had to grow and develop, is really celebrating people that are different than me, that bring different background, different skill sets, because I could see how it makes the team better. And so it has to be uh, come from that true humility about what's best for the team, not what's best for me personally. One question back there. Yeah. You talk about your thoughts on work-life balance throughout your career. Well, if I, you said the, the last part is where you threw me off. You said throughout my career, uh, because again, that would be the early days, it would be failure. I would have failed miserably in those days when, <coughs> frankly, uh, it's interesting, my wife and I were married while I was still a student. Uh, and then uh, after I started working for, uh, in the retail business, uh, we had three children and, uh, and in retailing, you do work a lot of hours. And, and I ended up ex going too far. And I did not have good work-life balance. And I also was not empowering the people that I was working with. So I had a combination problem where uh, I was not doing a good job of being a father and a husband and my other responsibilities. 
but also was not really empowering the people in the workplace. And I mentioned um, the lady that I worked with in Washington, D.C. I think when Jean taught me the lesson about empowering, uh, and she worked for me, she reported to me, and she gave me due criticism about not empowering the team. As I learned more about empowering and developing people, then guess what? I was able to go home more and I could spend more time uh, with my family. And then as I saw the benefit of that, I started to really celebrate uh, other executives that had the proper work-life balance. And I remember one particular Walmart officer meeting, uh, the uh, president of our company in the UK had sent me an email the day before a big officer meeting. And he said to me, his name was Andy. And he, he said, Mike, Andy here. He said, I'm, I'm really sorry about tomorrow morning's video conference. He said, I've got a really important appointment at my daughter's school that I need to go to instead of being at the officer's meeting. Uh, I sent him back a celebration and thanked him uh, for being a great role model. And I said, do you mind if I use you as, an, as a positive example of sending the right signal about that if you've got something that's more important with your family, then it's more important to do it. And, and we did, we celebrated Andy Vaughn and his time with his daughter in the school appointment on the officer video conference. So I failed at it, but I got better as time went on and, I, and it helped me on the job. Very good. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for being here and sharing your thoughts with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for participating and this concludes our program. For thank tonight. you all, great honor. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate it.